Thank you, Jean, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the whole community for the invitation here. I never had the pleasure of meeting um, Richard Lee, but I did have the opportunity last night to meet his wife and, and many of his friends, and so to hear many stories about his great contribution to Buffalo and more broadly to humanity. And I am humbled and honored um, to be asked to give this first talk. Choosing to talk about human extinction is not a light topic. <laughs> and it's a topic that actually we don't even want to think about. It's kind of like death. It's not the sort of thing we want to spend a lot of time thinking about. It's not a pleasant topic. But 95% of all species that ever inhabited the Earth have gone extinct. So I think it's prudent for us as one of the species, legitimate to consider this possibility. And indeed, if we think about public health, this would be the ultimate public health risk. And so I think the consummate professional that Dick Lee was would agree that it's okay for us to consider the prospect of human extinction and whether we might avert it. So if we start thinking about human extinction or what could happen to us, Usually, well, we don't really need to worry about that right now. I'm just trying to make ends meet and get food on the table. There, we can kind of figure that out. People are basically okay. Common sentiments, but I think risks being wishful thinking. So I want to begin by outlining what I see as three substantive risks that would cause human extinction within the next century. So one risk is violent self-destruction. We do not need to be deep students of history to understand that uh, folks in power have killed millions, tens of millions of people intentionally um, we saw this in the Holocaust with Hitler. We saw it in Stalin's purges, and this from Pol Pot in Cambodia. So we know throughout history, these aren't just some aberrations, that widespread human destruction through violent conflict is a part of our species. It is a part of our history. Something that has changed now in 2016 is that the technology for killing other people has become much more efficient and much more affordable and much more widely available. So it means that um, destruction then could be a lot easier. I grew up in, at a time when there was considerable concern about all of the nuclear missiles pointed between the Soviet Union and the U.S. There's still a lot of missiles targeting these two um, countries. But even beyond that now, we also have rogue states or folks getting technology that can wreak massive destruction on a very, um, on a low budget, small scale. What would it take to drive a truck with a, with a nuclear device into New York or into Washington, D.C. Uh, if there were an explosion that wreaked havoc in Tel Aviv or in Delhi, what would that mean for the global um, response? It's certainly possible that there would then be an escalation of conflict. And this might directly drive human extinction from nuclear winter and change in climate, or it, or it may just do massive disruption to the system of trade and free travel, and that we could have a collapse in the economic order. So um, I view this as a real risk and a growing risk because technology keeps getting more and more powerful and more and more available. A second potential risk is that we destroy our environment. 
um, the environment that sustains life. So this is a, a satellite photograph of the Aral Sea taken in 1989. The Aral Sea was formed five million years ago. Um, it was 225,000 square kilometers and a vigorous, productive ecosystem uh, that supported a local economy of fishing uh, and, and, uh, and, and an enormous productive both wetland area as well as the fishery itself. In the 1960s, the decision was made to say, wait a minute, let's divert the rivers that feed the Aral Sea and instead grow cotton. Well, why would you do that? Well, you can make money growing cotton. And so subsequently, the Aral Sea has basically disappeared. This is now called the Aralcom Desert. This ecosystem, five million years in the making, is dead. How did that happen? Because of what I call a perverse incentive. They're actually still making money selling cotton out of this diverted water, but we have destroyed this environment. I use this as an, an example, as an example because it shows us in a striking and visual way, but we don't need to read very much to think about the destruction of primary forest so that we can get wood, or the trawling of oceans and the destruction of our seawater habitat as we try to pull um, more and more fish out of it. And the same perverse incentive, let me destroy the earth and make money at it. This is a dynamic that is being repeated across multiple um, dimensions, but the risk is we hurt the earth, we hurt the earth, we hurt the earth, but at some point we destroy its carrying capacity, including its carrying capacity for us. We are biologically, uh, we are biological creatures, and so our health, our public health, is dependent upon planetary health, which is um, on a trajectory of profound destruction and mismanagement. A third risk I want to consider is what I call technology run amok. So technology has been one of the great forces of transition in human society. And we tend to think along a linear time frame and throughout most of human history, when we look at ourselves and compare to our parents' generation, there's not so much difference. What we were doing was similar to what our ancestors were doing a century or two before. But technology builds so quickly on itself that it creates exponential change. So that in fact we are quite different from our parents and our children quite different from us in terms of the world they're inhabiting and the technologies that are available. And I've talked about how technology can improve the efficiency of human um, violence and, and uh, destruction of the environment. But I also want to talk about, just as another example, nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is great. It's talking about working with technologies that are very small, so small that they exert quantum effects. And this has been really helpful in the semiconductor industry and really helpful in terms of creating new materials because you actually can begin to use some of these effects. Nanorobotics involves creating machines that work with components at this nanometer scale so that you can actually send these machines the oil. The nanobots destroy everything, all the while replicating themselves within days the planet is turned to dust. I don't know how probable this specific scenario is within the next century. On the other hand, it's not complete science fiction 
as we think of the trajectory of how nano robotics might develop. And the reason I present this example is actually even less about the particular risks of self-replicating nanotechnology and how those risks might be managed, but let us also think about CRISPR technology and all of the technology that we have to very fundamentally alter life on the planet. Again, this potentially could make this a much better place to live, but it also raises a risk of human extinction. Another dimension of um, technology risk has to do with the continued um, evolution of artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence is extremely helpful in terms of things like speech synthesis and recognition. There's great work done here on handwriting analysis. Um, we can do facial recognition. People on Facebook can say, oh, wait a minute, isn't that someone you know? We have um, driverless cars on the horizon, airline reservations, and all supply chain managements um, really being managed now through increasingly complex artificial intelligence systems. There's over three million lines of code for the Google search engines. Uh, and, and this weak artificial intelligence really has become increasingly capable. Strong artificial intelligence implies the idea that this becomes exponentially more capable. So already, computers can beat us at chess, they can compete us, they can, um, they can uh, outcompete us at Jeopardy, they can outcompete us in terms of complex um, supply chains. Eventually, as the capacity for calculation becomes more and more dense, and the number of calculations per second become higher and higher, um, these, this artificial intelligence will become exponentially more capable and most efficiently will be able to program itself to become more capable. So there, at some point, with this rapidly self-improving um, process, we will end up with likely emergence of consciousness and independent will. So my background is in philosophy and I think that um, we get enough intelligence I see this as a likely emergent property. Now maybe this will be great. Um, maybe with artificial intelligence, they can say, what are you doing with all of those nukes? Let's turn these down. Um, and maybe they will view us as we view gorillas, as yeah, we want to continue to support those primates a little bit, because that is where we came from. Alternatively, it may consider us pests. Um, so there is at least another big <coughs> risk here. So my argument to this point has been, it's a little uncomfortable, but my assertion is we face existential risk, and there are no ironclad guarantees that humanity is going to make it through the next hundred years. S so. If you, if you think that that is a reasonable risk, maybe if you even think it's only a 5 or a 10% risk, it's such an adverse outcome, we should think about how might we counter this risk? What steps might we take? And I start to think about what institutions might be able to help us counter such extreme risks. So first we might think about governments. This would seem to be a natural um, group to turn to. <laughs> yeah, then we start thinking about the level of the current government d discussion about where to go next and the short news cycle. I mean, there's just no way. I mean, they're not going to be thinking about this. Um, we might think about non-governmental organizations. Um, they don't have um, maybe some of those same ties, but. Their funding model is, is much harder to sustain, and these are really hard problems. And it can be difficult to convene the core of super capable people that are going to be needed to address them. 
um, corporations are amongst some of the most potent organizations, human organizations on the planet. But I would argue their incentives are not an aligned to really take care of these public good problems. So where might we turn? I think this is a natural place for universities. Indeed, I would argue that universities have the best aligned incentives to face these greatest threats facing humanity. Universities bring young people who are really interested to do relevant work in the world. And universities also offer academic freedom. You can choose to work on a problem that you think is important. And so there's a latitude to take this on that doesn't exist among certain constraints within government or other organizations. Also, these are really tough issues. And so we actually need our best minds working on it, and we really need multiple perspectives, and we need the benefits of interdisciplinarity uh, in order to be able to address them. And it's very, hard, it's very hard for me to think of any other organization that has the competence to take on these types of problems. So if I'm now giving this charge to the University of Buffalo, <laughs> We should talk a little bit about, oh, wait a minute, this, um, how would we do research on this? How does this fit with how we think traditionally about research um, at a university? And so I want to draw some comparisons between academic research and what I call public health research. Now, both of these require um, what has been required of scientists for as long as there has been science. And that is that we have to persuade people who have money to give it to us to generate some new knowledge. And so we need to do that whichever type of problem we're solving. Um, both public health research and general academic research or disciplinary based research requires rigorous methods. And both require an enormous amount of creativity and critical thinking to advance. Academic research gen tends to prioritize questions which disciplines have found to be interesting questions. Interesting questions over time. They value novel theoretical insights and, and use of disciplinary tools and disciplinary expertise. Um, they prioritize securing your PhD, securing tenure. And there's a lot of focus on problem orientation. How do we define, how do we think about this problem space? Public health research, by contrast, prioritizes useful questions. Questions that are useful in the world that if we solve them would be helpful. Practical applications, lots of multidisciplinary collaborations are natural in public health because you need to bring lots of people together to solve them. Um, there, that really prioritizes trying to make progress and improve the situation. And there's a focus on working towards solution or a tendency for solution orientation. Traditional academic research defends basic research with no immediate application and says this is really good because we don't know what will ultimately come out of this and so we should make some investments in basic research. And public health research has to continually ask the question, you know, with scarce resources, why should we invest in this line of research rather than that? How will this knowledge help to bring change? So. I would argue as we face these existential threats that even one thing that public health research can do going forward is actually the very process of public health research can come against some of the separation in the world that brings threats. Um, the process of public health research can connect very different people. Problem solving builds capacity and trust and reinforces our common humanity. But how might we as individual researchers think about taking on something like existential risks? I think we can break these down into tractable problems and go through steps of identifying a problem, explicating the causal path that generates the problem, developing an intervention to interrupt that causal path, 
piloting the intervention, rigorously testing it and scaling it up. So we can imagine we have models within public health of a continuity of research work that can get you towards solution. So how might one researcher think about that? Well, let me go back to this issue with the RLC and perverse incentives. The idea that people are being paid money, getting big rewards for destroying the earth. That's what I call a perverse incentive. And I would um, assert that if we don't figure out how to correct this perverse incentive problem, we don't have a future for humanity. So this seems to me in a big picture worth addressing, but how do I make that tractable? Well, in South Asia, where I've lived for 13 years and worked for 20, um, brick kilns um, are a problem. Uh, they, the, the, the radiative forcing from the emissions of brick kilns in South Asia are equivalent to the entire U.S. passenger car fleet. So they generate lots of greenhouse gas. Um, and in Bangladesh, just in Bangladesh, just in, the, in, in um, Dhaka, the capital city where I live, modeled estimates that there are 5,000 excess deaths each winter from the particulate matter that comes from brick kilns. So this is a kind of perverse incentive. You're making money selling cheap bricks, and you're killing 5,000 people a year. So why would this happen? Um, well, so we did an anthropological study talking with the groups that were involved. Um, why would you sell soil to manufacture bricks? Well, I would, farmers will sell their soil because you make money doing it. They also say that, well, if all of my neighbors sell their soil and then my land is the only elevated land, then it won't retain water. And so then, then I can't grow crops anyway. So if everybody else around me sells, I have to sell. So that's, and that's over half of the selling going on because of that dynamic. Um, they lose agricultural productivity that is not recovered. And we estimate that there's 100 mil million kilograms of lost harvest nationally because of using the topsoil in this way. So this is another perverse outcome of cheap bricks. So we talked to the brick purchasers. The brick purchasers said that they seek quality bricks at the lowest possible price. And there are two types of bricks, bangla bricks, which cost about eight or nine cents each, and auto bricks or machine-made bricks that cost about 13 to 17 cents each. And these bricks um, you can make more efficiently and generate less pollution. But the purchaser said, we have different types of projects, such as diamond, gold, and silver, and rose. Generally, we use machine-made bricks for diamond category apartment complexes, which are very costly. Otherwise, we use bangla bricks for other purposes. Indeed, bangla bricks have 90% of the market. They said, we, the consumers, are not liable for air pollution created by brick kilns. Our duty is to build houses, and we need bricks to construct them. This is not our duty to observe which kiln is responsible for air pollution. Just doing my job, just earning a living. The kiln owners, we asked them, why would you use kilns that generate so much pollution? And they said, the big thing is it's the lowest capital cost. It's 10% of interrupt this zigzag conversion. So we're not asking um, kiln owners to pay money going forward and not getting a return. So what might we do to encourage this? Well, I think we need to think a little bit differently about why firms adopt environmental behavior. So, so these are data from Indonesia, and this is from textile plants. So these are textile plants from Indonesia in the 1990s. Indonesia, weak state, same difficulty, can't enforce um, 
regulations. There are 27 textile plants at this time, and this is the kilograms of biological oxygen demand per ton of textiles produced. So this is a measure of the pollution, and what you see is that some plants, um, some plants are really highly polluting up here. Um, they're, they're way above even the Indonesian standards. They're just making all sorts of pollution. There are a bunch of um, plants here in the middle, and then there are a bunch of plants that not only beat the Indonesian standards, but comply with U.S. standards. So why would these plants be polluting so much? In some sense, we understand this. Why would they invest in pollution control? They can make more profit this way. So this is, in some sense, understandable. This is the Aral Sea. Wait a minute, I want to make more money. The bigger question is, why are these plants polluting so little? There's no state that is strong enough to enforce regulations, yet they're not only beating Indonesian standards, they're beating high-income country standards. Uh, and so it turns out that firms are more likely to abate pollution if they are privately owned, not government run, if they're part of a large scale competitive industry, and if the local community is highly educated. If the local community is highly educated, they have all sorts of informal ways to put pressure to say, wait a minute, you're part of the Orchard Park community. Let's. Um, uh, my children are going to school here, they, they exert pressure to make plants pollute less, even in the absence of strong government enforcement. And these findings of the importance of a highly educated community around plants has been um, replicated in similar patterns in Thailand, Bangladesh, and the U.S. So, um, so I think that we should think in about pollution control, not just around the state, but also think about the markets and community as part of a pollution abatement triangle. And better information might empower both regulators and communities about what they might do. So a um, project we recently got funded for is to count the kilns in Bangladesh. And we're using low-cost remote satellite data with a geophysicist, um, Howard Zebker at Stanford. We're then developing a publicly available website that presents the information on kiln location, type, and proximity to human settlement. So now everybody knows what's out there. to the food difficult times. So in conclusion, I argue that humanity faces a substantial risk of imminent extinction. I believe that the public health research community based in universities has both the tools and the responsibility to address these risks. Thank you.